today's topic will be mainly about um, some image analysis tools applied for uh, bioimaging, specifically fluorescence microscopy Im Im imaging. Um, so a little bit See, a little bit about who we are. So as Wen just introduced, uh, so I am the mm -hmm. technical director of the Multi-Photon and Analytical Imaging Center at the URMC. We are part of the shared resource labs. So we provide equipment to services uh, to all the researchers on campus or uh, in the nearby institutes. Uh, we work closely on a daily basis with the biomedical researchers and uh, from all different departments uh, to conduct mainly for my core multi-photon fluorescence imaging. And also we collaborate with uh, biologists uh, to help them do image analysis. Uh, and also I will be very um, like glad if I can see more collaborations with other data scientists uh, to work on some of the bioimage analysis problems we have here because on daily basis we see a lot of different image analysis problems that biologists have. So for today's talk, I will mainly focus on two projects we have been working on in the lab um, that we um, we, we saw those difficulties when we conduct uh, imaging uh, using the fluorescence microscopy. So we look for ways that has been uh, fully developed in other fields that are easy and simple to use and try to apply it for the bio images. And uh, we want it to be easy to use, but in a robust way. Uh, before I go to the details of those two um, projects, I first uh, developed this section as an introduction of uh, fluorescence microscopy basics, the applications and also the limitations as an uh, introduction to highlight what kind of uh, limitations we have with the fluorescence microscopy. Um, some of the, you may know about a fluorescence microscopy. Here is just uh, some basics about the mm, regular fluorescence microscopy. So it is a group of uh, microscopy techniques. So underneath it, there are many different types, but the um, the bare bone of it is very simple and highlighted here. So with the any fluorescence microscopy, you need a light source, which is usually a laser for our case as excitation light source at a certain specific wavelength. And uh, then it be, will be directed to the sample, which is fluorescently labeled with a certain fluorophore in a specific tissue structure, for example. And that fluorophore can be excited by the laser and then emit uh, at a certain wavelength. And that emission signal will be detected by detectors. Um, and for our case, um, the most commonly used detectors are phot photon multiplier tubes, which are a little bit different from the regular camera we, we use. So here we will need a fluorescently labeled sample first. And also the commonly used uh, fluorescence microscopy techniques uh, such as confocal microscopy and two, uh, multi photon microscopy. Sometimes you may hear two photon microscopy. It's basically very similar things here with the multi photon microscopy. So the nice thing about multi photon microscopy is that it can image very deep into the tissue. Um, and uh, comparing to the traditional, what we call one photon microscopy techniques such as confocal. And uh, just as a reference, usually we can image like um, into 400, 500 micron, micrometer depth easily. Um, comparing to confocal, usually it's within 50 micrometer depth. And because of this uniqueness and the multi-photon microscopy have been very commonly used for thick tissue sections imaging, so people don't need to slice it to make it a slide. And also it's been more commonly used for live animal imaging because you don't, uh, you, you can image the animal live and the people can study the tissue uh, under the most natural environment. Uh, right. Are there some questions? Someone has a question? I cannot hear. Hello? 
I think it was um, simply somebody background okay. noise, background okay. noise. Okay. Yeah. Feel free to uh, chip in if you have any questions. Okay. Um, so, um, a, so it has been commonly applied for biomedical research to study tissue structures, cellular dynamics, uh, disease mechanisms, and so on. Um, here, I would like to uh, show you three examples of the images collected on, under a multi-photon uh, microscope. So uh, the first one here is a human lung tissue. Uh, and this is a 3D image on the fixed uh, sample. And there are five colors uh, labeling. And what we are looking at is from the surface of the tissue to the bottom and to the very bottom we can see. So it's a loop played of the 3D. And the second example here is a live mouse uh, skin image. And this is a 4D image, uh, which my user collected a 3D image and uh, repetitively and uh, form a time lapse here. Uh, and what you can see moving inside the tissue here are the fluorescently labeled uh, T cells, which are kind of immune cells. So that group is specifically interested in under disease model, how the immune cells dynamics change and how the interactions with tissue change. Um, the last example here is another live sample, which is a fruit flies embryo uh, image. And uh, mm, this group is interested in the development of the embryo. So what they did is they collected the data from the begin very early stage of the embryo development and track the cells divisions and movement along the time um, and uh, with the two photon or multi-photon microscope. So uh, what you may notice here is um, that for multi-photon microscopy, it is um, uh, multi-dimensional, which uh, can be 3D, 4D, and also will be multicolor. That's another spectral dimension we add on. So um, here I want to elaborate more on the process, how a image is collected here. So I can highlight uh, what restrictions we have here with the fluorescence microscopy. So unlike any camera captured images, uh, uh, the, the fluorescence microscopy we talk about here, a mainly called fluorescence laser scanning microscopy, which include a scanning part. And the, with fluorescence laser scanning microscopy, we rather, rather than shining the entire excitation light on the entire field of view, we have a very small point of laser that scans through pixel by pixel across the XY field of view one pixel by pixel. So you can see that it is a scanning process and the, the speed can be very slow depending on how fast the scanner moves. And if the laser light hit on a pixel which has a fluorescence uh, in that, that pixel will emit uh, an emission signal. And if that emission signal is within the uh, detect one detector's detection and it will be detected by that specific detector. And we can have multiple detectors on our system with different uh, spectral band. And then the detector will map that pixel onto the displayed image as one single pixel. So that's the entire process of uh, how a uh, fluorescence image is produced on our system. And uh, earlier I mentioned that multi-photon microscopy is unique in that it can image very deep into the tissue so we can do very thick 3D imaging. So uh, then what it will do is it will move the objective one step further down into the tissue and repeat the entire thing, uh, the, sa the same thing, and collect another image at a different depth. So with that, we can collect a lot of different depth images and reconstruct it as a 3D image. So that's, that's how we collect a uh, 3D image under our fluorescence mi microscope. So uh, then with that, you may realize uh, there are a few limitations here that can restrict the applications of the fluorescence microscopy. So those are the three resolutions of the mic microscopy that people usually evaluate uh, how it performs. So it has a spatial resolution, temporal resolution, and spectral resolution. Biologists always want 
every single one of those to be the highest. However, if you increase one of it, the other two end of the spectrum will decrease at the same time. So those are the three conflicting factors that will be very hard to achieve all of them uh, at a very high level simultaneously only with our hardware design. So in the microscopy field, um, there are a lot of fancy designs of uh, different systems trying to achieve high, highest spatial or highest temporal or spectral resolutions. Uh, however, those, those designs usually are will be ultimately limited by the, the law of physics. So there will be certain points we cannot break the law. So uh, because we, we are limited by the system hardware design. So we are starting to figure out ways how we can achieve better performance of the microscope with post-processing methods. Uh, so then I move to the next part, which will be a project we have, we have done to uh, try to uh, lifting the spectral limitations of the fluorescence microscopy with a very simple and easy to use computational tool. Mm. So earlier I mentioned that uh, for fluorescence microscopy, we definitely need to have fluorescence label in the sample. So uh, fluorescent labels, so any fluorophores will have a distribution of their emission signals uh, along the spectrum band. And uh, those here, I plotted four very commonly used fluorescent uh, dyes uh, spectrum along the along uh, the entire wavelength range. And uh, you, uh, the first thing uh, you may notice that is the emission spectrum can be very broad and some of them can be overlapping. And also uh, the, the bar here I plotted, those are our filters uh, that uh, in front of our detectors, which uh, specify what wavelength band we can detect with a certain uh, detector. And we can see that the detection band are also not very specific, which means it has a range rather than a specific point. And also because it has a range, the amount of detection band we can place here are limited. Um, so with all of this, we can see that the detection signals will be ultimately be mixed uh, uh, even like only with four fluorophores here. And also the total number of fluorophores we can detect are also limited. So we cannot detect as many of fluorophores we want. Uh, usually for a very standard multi-photon microscope, uh, people usually detect two colors. And for my system, it has four detectors. So we usually can do three or four colors um, simultaneously. Um, however, uh, you can see here, even with only three or four colors, uh, we will have what we call channel bleed through issue, which under one detection channel, we can detect multiple signals. Um, on the other side is that biologists always want to see more colors simultaneously, but um, hardware wise, we do have the limitations to achieve more colors with the fluorescence microscopy. So um, there are definitely other hardware designs that can push the limit maybe to add one or two more fluorophores uh, to be able to be detected. However, those designs can always be very expensive. So then we, uh, are trying to figure out if there are ways that we can use post-processing to deal with the channel bleed through issue we have with the fluorescence microscopy. So there are certain features with the computational tool for what we call spectral and mixing uh, here we want to achieve. First of all, we do want the tool to be blind, which means that uh, we don't want to the, the tool needs to know some prior knowledge of the spectral information. There are definitely tools on the market that people need to measure the spectra of all the fluorophores they have in the sample first and then set into the tool and do a kind of a deconvolution to be able to uh, mix all the fluorophores, uh, which can be expensive and also time consuming and uh, not very realistic. So we do want the tool to be blind. So. Uh, no, no prior knowledge uh, is required. Uh, secondly is um, ideally we want um, the total number of fluorophores we can uh, 
like measure or separate be more than the total number of detection channels we have. So the total amount of detection channels can be a hard limit on the detection signals. However, the, if the tools can separate out more fluorophores based on the current information we have, that will be a, a better tool for people who want to push the limit of the hardware. Uh, thirdly is uh, we uh, co-localization is allowed for the tool, which means uh, two fluorophores can label the same structure and show up in the same pixels. And this kind of labeling is very common with biology studies and a lot of biologists uh, actually evaluate the co-localization. So the mixing tool cannot fail when there are co-localization happening in the sample. And lastly is it needs to be computationally light because this is just the first step for post-processing. We uh, don't want it to be very time consuming and require a lot of computational efforts. So with those, uh, we first examined all the available spectral uh, mixing tools and highlighted the, those commonly used ones on the market. And none of those are ha having all the features available here. For example, some of them are not blind and would require the prior information about the spectra. Um, spectra. And some of them cannot do more uh, fluorophores than the detection channels. And some of the newly developed tool, fancy tools, like some Develop someone develop auto encoder for the um, uh, mixing. Uh, it's uh, a li little bit overkilling and it is uh, relatively computationally ex like expensive. So the goal of us to is to find something simple to use and uh, is robust and uh, ideally having all the features here we want to achieve. So our solution we gave a name uh, of Lumos and uh, I will. Hi, later on talking about what is Lumos. So um, when we uh, plot our pixels intensities um, under different uh, detection channels, um, intuitively, we if the pixels are from different of uh, uh, fluorescent having are labeled with different fluorescent dye, uh, they will be distributed on um, different space uh, in the in the in the plot. And so the pixel uh, intest so the pixels with the same label tends to group together. And uh, then we realized that we can easily use a clustering method to be able to group those pixels having the similar uh, profile of their intensity under all the detection channels. So the first thing we thought about would be k-means, which is the mm, same place the clustering methods we can use. And uh, the nice thing is that it only requires individual pixels intensity information under each of the detection channel. That's all we need. And we give a name, we call it a learning and supervised mean of spectra, LUMOS. And my former lab Analyst, data analyst gave the name and inspired by the one of the uh, magic spells from Harry Potter, if anyone is Harry Potter fan. Um, and the, the underlying uh, thing about the Lumos is just k-means, which is very straightforward. And we just initialize um, uh, with k random uh, Centroids and uh, assign the data points to each of the cluster based on the closest mean and repeat the whole process. Um, An individual uh, spot on the plot here would be every pixel's intensity under the detection channel. Here is a two detection channel case. We can have more detection channels. It will be multi-dimensional. Um, the ultimate goal here is to group pixels with the same spectral signature, which we give the name for the spectral profile of the in individual pixels as spectral signature to group them together so that it, those pixels can be assigned to a specific fluorophore. Um, one of the drawbacks of K means that original algorithm is that the K, the number of K will be hard to define. However, for this application specifically, the K is already known, and that's the, the greatest thing here. And the K here, we assign it to be the total number of fluorophores we have inside the sample plus one. And the additional one here is the background noise. 
So for any uh, microscopy images, uh, there will be by nature some background noise captured. And those background noise would be different, showing differently uh, in profile comparing to those pixels who are labeled with a certain fluorophore. So those, the, this would be our K. And uh, K also doesn't need to be equal to the total number of detection channels we have. It can be more than that. And because we have an additional cluster, which is our background noise, um, the, the, the other side benefit from the LUMOS algorithm is that uh, we can also do background noise removal uh, with LUMOS. So a lot of biologists also like this. I had a question. Sure. Yeah, um, you talked about a profile and I guess I'm not quite sure um, how many, if this was an image, right? Uh, how many uh, records? How many spectral records are you working with here mm -hmm. in order to derive your profile? Um, your profile um, is based on clusters of pixels. And so mm -hmm. can you make, perhaps you're going to describe that. That that seems like that's kind of a key. I, mean, I guess I was thinking of analogies with, you know, detection in color space, for example, visual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, you mean like how many, um, how many, different detection channels we have. Yes, that, so, would, be, that would be helpful, yeah. Yeah, so uh, if we go through the uh, few examples here to uh, show like how well the algorithm perform, you may see that we have different cases of different numbers of detectors we have. I and see. also later on, I have a simulation like uh, results that will elaborate on like how many total, total number of uh, floor force we can have to push the limit, yeah. We, uh, I'll get back to you to make sure, uh, yeah, this part is answered, okay? Yeah, so the first example here is a, the simplest one. And uh, this one uh, example, is, we started with the same number of floor force as the detection channels we have. So this is a, a fixed cell slide that has three colors on it. So we use three channels on our system. And what you see here, this, those the four images are our original image images. And we have three colors, the blue, green, and red. And the last one is the combined. And uh, so um, and different compartments inside the cells are labeled with a specific color. And uh, um, for the blue signal, you may see that it has uh, the similar um, structure showing up in the green signal as well. So this, uh, we can also tell this by looking at the spectral um, emission spectrum, which is um, some information available measured by other people online. So we can see that the blue spectrum overlap significantly with the green signal here and can be detected by our green band of uh, the detector here. So that's why we sh see the double signal in the, in the green channel. So then we applied LUMOS on the blue and green channels. And so in this case, we use two channels, uh, try to separate two colors here. And uh, so we can see that uh, the, the blue signal is completely uh, se separate out from the green signal. Um, and when we plot the spectral signature I mentioned earlier, so we plotted um, the uh, our blue signals uh, signature, the green signals signature, and also the background signature um, under the two detectors here. So we can see that there's a, a, a di distinct differences between the blue signals versus the green signals. So because of these different uh, signatures um, between those two signals, we are able to perform the, uh, the algorithm on, on our images to do the separations. And uh, then we moved on to try to push the limit, try to see how about if we have more floor force than the channels. Uh, here is one example of a um, kind of cells that biologists developed. They call it colorful cells because it has many colors in it. And this kind of cell has three or six different colors labeled with six different um, compartments inside the cell. And we are trying to see if the algorithm will separate all of those six. And this 
is our raw image from our uh, uh, from our system. And you can see that a lot of in between those channels, there are a lot of signal overlap. And also the signals are not specific to us one's a biological structure and um, the output is very ambiguous. So with this, we sent the um, sent this image into the Lumos algorithm and uh, this row here is the unmixed result. So you can see that with uh, Lumos, um, this uh, algorithm can separate out all the different uh, fluorophores in, in the sample. And because originally this sample has had six colors here, but we only had five detectors, then the outputs will add one additional fluorophore here so that the output has more fluorophores than the original detector numbers. And so this is the uh, ultimate result of the composite, which we can see that all the signals are very specific in the each of the compartments of the cell. So the algorithm performed very robustly on those uh, images that has more fluorophores than our detection channels. So um, the last thing we did was to test the limitations of the algorithm, trying to see um, under the worst scenario uh, until a certain point, when does the algorithm fail? So we did some simulations and like some theoretical um, uh, reconstruction of the fluorophores uh, spectrum. And we um, um, just add more fluorophores into the uh, simulation, simulation. And uh, um, we assume that we only had four detection channels here. And uh, because it's simulating our results, uh, we know what's the ground truth here. Uh, so we simulated under three different scenarios, trying to test the different uh, worst case scenarios here. The first scenario is we adjust the clustering size, which is a specific structure, labeled structure size. So we assume that when a structure become too small, it will be the algorithm will fail to be able to separate that out. That's uh, by nature also some uh, drawbacks of the k-means if uh, there is a imbalance of the st a structure size. So we can see until a point there is a drop of the performance of, of the uh, algorithm when the cluster size ratio become too small. The second one we tested is we want to see how many fluorophores in total we are able to separate under a four detection channel scenario. And under here, we can see that we can um, uh, separate up around 11 uh, fluorophores here before it uh, dropped down under uh, 0.9, the F1 score. And the last thing we tested here is the signal noise ratio. So sometimes biology, uh, biological images can be very bad in quality and the signal noise ratio can be bad. So we want to see into how bad the signal noise ratio of uh, the algorithm will fail. So uh, it will be around one half before it drop down below zero, 0 0.9 for the F1 score. So those are the things we Mm, uh, we done with the with the our developed tool for spectral mixing, and uh, the it, it turns out to be a very robust, easy to use tool. And uh, uh, when we look back on the uh, our table to comparing the features of the desired features, we realize that we can achieve all of the goals here. And uh, mm, actually, a lot of our users starting using the tool and push the limit, uh, hardware limit of my uh, microscope, some of my users started to uh, be able to see six or seven colors under two photon microscope, which has been very rarely achieved uh, before. And also other uh, people in other institutes start using the uh, tools as well and have very good feedback. So that's a small story about one um, a uh, nice easy way we use the, to deal with the hardware limitations on um, our fluorescence microscopy. Before I move on to the next part, I just want to check if we have any other questions. And uh, I don't remember who asked the previous question. Was that Peter? Did I answer your question? 
Uh, yes, yes, oh, I, I think wait. I think so. Um, I guess I was thinking of the detection channel um, in your context might be a combination of a detector, mm -hmm. spectral characteristics, as well as an excitation uh, laser. Uh, the, the combination of the two gives you your detection channel. Am I right? That's a great point. I didn't go very deep into that. So okay. um, that's a great point. So I didn't uh, touch very deep on that point. So for this example, this is a more complicated example here. I, I didn't highlight here. Uh, we actually uh, were able to detect, like scan twice with two different lasers and detect it under the same detector. That is, uh, we I usually see. call it a sequential scan uh, under our system. Uh, you can that, so in that way, we can actually consider it as uh, what you said, like two detection scenarios here. Mm -hmm. um, it is not very easy to do with multi-photon um, microscopy. And be, it is mainly because the laser itself is very expensive. So and most of the two multi-photon microscope you see on the market would be only one laser. So you, at one time, you can only use one wavelength. For my system, we have two lasers. So like um, the maximum you can get excitation would be two different wavelengths. Yeah. I see. So, OK, very yeah. good. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll move to the next part, which is a ongoing project at the lab. Uh, we try to tackle another spectrum on our limitations, which are the spectral, uh, spatial and temporal resolution limitations um, of our uh, microscope. Um, so just a revisit of what I showed earlier. Uh, so we see that the fluorescence laser scanning microscopy, it scans pixel by pixel, which will make it very slow uh, when we compare it to the camera imaging. Uh, camera imaging will be just like instant snapshot. But for our microscope, um, I'll show an for your reference, like a 512 by 512 pixel with our, what I call regular scanner on our system, it takes one second. So imagine that if we have many different Z depths, it will take very long to, to, to shoot a 3D image. And we can definitely increase the speed with different um, ways um, by imaging side. So for example, we can decrease the total amount of pixels we want to scan here. However, there will be a down sampling and uh, it will, we have the risk to lower the resolution of the image we get. So that's one. And the second one is we can find a faster scanner to do this scanning much faster. And also um, in the optics uh, field, we do have the faster scanner available. And later on, you, you may see I named those as a resonance scanner. So those scanners comparing to our regular scanners can scan about 30 times faster. However, those faster scanner, because they scan so fast, um, it will lower the signal to noise ratio we get of those images. So usually those faster scanners uh, images you acquired would be high background noise. Um, on the other side, biologists always want more. They want uh, faster imaging and also high res spatial resolution. So faster imaging because they want to do things in life. So they want to capture the dynamics that's happening inside the cell or inside the tissue. But they also want to see the details of the structure in those, uh, in those, uh, in those tissues. So they, they know what they are looking at. So, um, um, it, we can see that uh, hardware-wise, it's still it's hard to achieve both, um, and so we look into other fields, trying to see what in other fields people are doing, try to boost up the uh, resolution of the image. So. Um, Current state of the art, uh, there's popular field um, image super resolution. People use deep neural networks uh, to map from the low resolution images to the high resolution images. And those were mainly used for camera or we call natural images. Um, and usually uh, due to the nature of the camera images, uh, they use the image pairs as the way that they acquire the high resolution images, but then sample it to be the low resolution image pair and uh, with either bicubic or Gaussian, but um, 
in this way, first, it's a mathematical way to downsample it. It may not be true to the real low uh, resolution image. And also there is no noise, usually no noise added. So there is no denoising part with the, with the model. Um, the most popular ones are, are, are SR ResNet or SRGN. And uh, it has been uh, very popular back in a few years before. So uh, with this, we were thinking, can we apply the similar model here to the bioimaging field? And so um, for bioimages, uh, we, we can see that there are hardware and acquisition time limitations that will limit our image resolution. Uh, so we need some computational tools, ideally, to boost up our image resolution um, to save the acquisition time so people can acquire image very fast but with less detail. And because they acquire fast, they will be outputting a low resolution image. So we want to send those low resolution image into our trained network so that it will output a high resolution counterpart to the, to the, to the low resolution image. Um, so the bio images, our fluorescence microscopy images have some similarities with natural camera images, but it also have a lot of differences because the uh, optics pathways and how the images are acquired are all different from those camera images. Uh, and uh, the unique thing here is you may realize we can adjust the acquisition parameters here easily with the hardware uh, design to be able to acquire both the low resolution image and the high resolution image of the same field of view. So we can easily get uh, the, the, the pairs of the training data set for the model. So here is one example just to show you, uh, get an get idea how long it takes to acquire image. So this is a uh, three color image under my system. And if it's 512 by 512 pixels with our slow scanner, or we call it a regular scanner, it takes about two seconds here to scan the entire, to get the entire 2D image. If we do it 2048 by 2048, the same scanner, it will be about one minute and it will be impossible for biologists to do it this way. But you can, you may notice that it will give you much more details of the structures here. The last one here is a, uh, uh, the same 512 by 512 uh, image, but we use a faster scanner here and uh, then it will, increase the speed a lot, only takes about 7, 8 milliseconds here to, to acquire the same, same field of view. But uh, you may notice there are a lot of background noise here and there, and also the structure are not very in detail. So um, with this, we can see that uh, we we do we can get a high resolution image, but it will take time. So for for us who developed the, the tool, we can take the time, try to acquire a lot of training data sets with the same field of view and train the model. And then ideally when biologists acquire the data, they only need to get the last one like this. And then the model can give them a better, high, higher resolution image uh, that will reveal more detailed structures. So that's the goal here. Um, the pr approach is uh, what we tried is uh, many focus on SRGAN. We also tried the a SR ResNet as well. Um, and um, I believe all of you are pretty familiar with it. So uh, the GAN network will have, it does have a generator and a discriminator, two parts. And the, the loss will be the combine of the, the two parts here. And uh, the generator will transfer or transform the low resolution image into the high resolution image. And the discriminator will guide through this process to make sure the output looks like the real high resolution images here. Um, it was developed, the, the entire network was uh, uh, originally developed for natural camera images and the network was also trained on the natural camera images. Um, so we want to see if we can directly use the network to our uh, fluorescence microscopy images. And also, um, are we able to train the network to be better suited for the bio images here uh, to make it a little bit different from the original network's name? We call it a fluor uh, SRGN, uh, stand for fluorescence microscopy SRGN here. 
Um, so a uh, little bit detail, more details about the generator and the discriminator uh, architecture here. It's exactly the same as the original network here. We just used our, uh, our own images uh, to train the model. Um, the first thing we tested was if we can have a free ride here just to use the originally trained natural net model um, to directly apply to our images. So, uh, but the end result was not very good as what we can imagine. So left side, this is the, uh, our low resolution image. Over the right side is our ground truth, which is the high resolution image. In the middle, in the middle here, it is the output from the originally trained uh, SRDM model. And we can see the, a lot of structures are um, outputted not the way we want. For example, the filament structure here are pretty uh, patched and uh, spotty and um, uh, not what we usually see uh, for our bio images. So we think that, oh, we cannot directly use the original network for our bio mm -hmm. images. So the next thing we did was to retrain the model. Uh, we didn't start with a scratch. We uh, transfer learn the model just by uh, using the originally trained model add on top with our more training data set from the about uh, fluorescence images. Uh, we benefit or leverage the, the original trained network uh, by using the similarities between the camera image and also the fluorescence microscopy images. And add on top, we retrain the network so that we can add additional differences um, of our uh, images comparing to the camera images. So here are some information about uh, what training data set we use. Uh, so we use image uh, pairs here. Uh, we have three different kinds of data. Uh, the first one we call it the low resolution, which we use the regular scanner acquired 512 by 512. And then we use the, the high resolution um, uh, image, which is four times uh, more pixel or four by four times more pixels here. And the last kind of image here is what we call a low, low resolution, which are images uh, same uh, amount of pixels, 512 by 512 as the low resolution, but we use the faster scanner. So you saw earlier those uh, images will have higher noise, also a uh, little bit less uh, uh, spatial resolution comparing to the low resolution. So uh, we trained as two separate uh, network at current stage, probably later on we will combine those. So what we train is a uh, low resolution network, which will use low res and high res image as a pair. And we also have a separate network where we used uh, the low, low res and high resolution image as an, a, a pair. So that's what we did. And the training data set type, uh, we have uh, different varieties of uh, bio samples here. And uh, also we tend to want to include different uh, structure types and different labels here to be more inclusive with the model. So we have human kidney, hu human sp spleny and mouse kidney, mouse placenta, and also some synthetic data as well. Uh, about 200 patch patches for each data, data type. And uh, each patch, so we crop the original image into a smaller field of view. Uh, some of them are 640 by 640. Some of them are 128 by 128. And for validation data set, we use completely different uh, 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 data. Uh, some of them are uh, fixed uh, cells and some of them are human lung data. Um, and uh, for results wise, uh, we have different uh, ways to evaluate our results. The first and most direct way is by Vero check. So uh, virally, uh, we want to see if uh, by eye, we can see there is a significant increase of the resolution with the output of our network. So what we see here is one close to look example of, the, uh, of different uh, networks output. So over the right here, this is the ground truth, which is the high resolution image. And over the left here is the low resolution image. The top uh, row here is the our regular scanners output. The bottom row here is the faster scanners output. So this one has more uh, noise you can see with the low resolution image here. 
This column is the bicubic uh, interpolation result. Uh, this SR GAN column is the natural models. Uh, it hasn't been trained on our data's output, so you can see it's not very realistic. Um, this one is the SR ResNet output, and this column is the SR GANs output. So uh, you can see that um, the SR GAN uh, output is closest to the ground truth uh, result. Uh, the SR ResNet uh, output is more like a filtered output where it's, uh, it's more smooth, um, but it's not uh, very close to the ground truth high resolution image. So uh, virally at the SR GAN performs uh, much better. Um, so um, we also want to evaluate quantitatively here. So we used a few, um, several commonly used uh, metrics uh, within the field, like um, P, uh, PSNR, the peak signal noise ratio, and uh, the as same uh, those two uh, metric. Uh, we want to evaluate the performance uh, quantitatively and compare uh, among different methods here. Uh, the last two rows here are our uh, SRGN um, model trained on our, uh, our data and also the SR ResNet uh, model, the result. And we can see that uh, those two outperform the other, the other methods we had here. Um, and we also train that the work uh, similarly, as what we uh, what they use for the original SRG is we also downsampled our high resolution data into the low resolution data to use those as a pair rather than rather than using the acquired low resolution image here. So you can see that with that uh, the training uh, the the model performance uh, was not as good as what we have with the real, real world data. So uh, um, one thing you may notice that is, uh, so the bolded ones are the highest performed uh, ones and uh, the SR ResNet actually outperformed the SR GAN here, uh, which is uh, actually not surprising by considering what um, metrics we use here. Uh, so this one you can see uh, virally it is more smooth and less noisy, but um, it, it doesn't have the, the details or the, the similar look as what the ground truth data is. But with those measurements, we cannot have a very good metric to uh, highlight these uh, differences here. So um, with this, I uh, so this as this work is still ongoing, so we're currently seeking other uh, directions here, trying to improve the model. Uh, the first thing we want to do is uh, we want to apply it to 3D images here. Uh, as you can see, we only focus on 2D image now, and in the future, ideally, we want the model to work in the Z dimension as well, because uh, 3D images are mostly commonly used by the biologists, um, and also the Z dimension is also very important. Um, secondly, uh, we want to have uh, other better evaluation metric for super, super resolved images, um, specifically for the bioimages here. So as you can see, the metric we currently use are not uh, like, they are not, not ideal, not very good to, to give the results. Um, so we want to see if there are other metric we can use to better evaluate. Um, third one is we also want to extend to other imaging modalities. Currently, we only focus on the multi-photon images here. We also have the options to use different imaging modalities or using even the imaging pairs across the modality. For example, in the imaging field, uh, we also have a type of uh, imaging technique, we call it super resolution imaging, which people developed, uh, which will break the basic physics law of the uh, image resolution you can get. One of the type of the super resolution image is called STAD, and we actually have it at our core facility. So our um, idea is to uh, collect the image under both confocal and the STAD super resolution image and try to train the model to learn how to 
go from a confocal image to a stat super resolution image. That's, those are just some ideas. And last thing is definitely we want to the network to be more general so that it be, can be applied to many different uh, biology structures. Um, with this, I think that's the end of my talk. And uh, I want to thank my former uh, data analyst, Tristan McRae, who uh, um, most of the work was uh, done by, by him. And also the funding was from the uh, University of Rochester. Uh, and uh, here is my contact email. Uh, if you guys have any questions you want to um, interact mm -hmm. feel free to email me. Okay, thank you. And uh, welcome, any questions? I have a question of uh, um, how long have you uh, been working at these various stages of, uh, of developing uh, your technique? Mm, how long? You mean? Yeah, the project. Uh, the first one, the spectral mixing, I think we did it within uh, uh, about one year. And those two projects were actually like, um, um, like the, we were running it uh, like pretty at the same time. Uh, the second project, we probably have been doing it for about one year, uh, but my former analyst left. So I, I, I had some, a, a new person to start pretty soon on the second project. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Sure. Uh, I had a, a question. And yeah. that, that was in the evaluation of the results. Mm -hmm. And uh, you showed the uh, the visual results and that kind of makes sense. And in your um, statistical analysis, um, for example, the similarity measure that you have there, mm -hmm. uh, we, were you using as a reference? Because as I understand that when I've used that before, yep. uh, as a reference, were you using the high resolution version? Mm -hmm. yeah, I see. Exactly. Okay. I yeah. see. So we um we didn't think so we didn't spend much time thinking about what evaluation metric we should use. So we directly use the exact same mm -hmm. metric people use for like original uh, SRGAN network they developed. They evaluated the similar ways. So we directly use those. It may not be the best for our cases. Uh, so we definitely need to find better ways for bioimages here. Yeah, it, it makes sense. Uh, um, for example, uh, that's that's been used, for example, with compressed images, right? Where you have an original and a compressed and an uncompressed. Um, I guess I was also thinking, this isn't really a question, but an observation in it makes sense doing what you were doing because your customers are probably used to looking at the images. I mm -hmm. guess I was thinking in some of these, it's good to think about the final task. In other words, sometimes I get involved with, um, I don't know, object recognition or some, mm -hmm. some, some, the processing of the images may not be for viewing. It may be for um, object differentiation, mm -hmm. um, disease state, yeah. evaluation I'm guessing um, mm -hmm. so it might be an interesting um, I, and I'm assuming that's often done an interesting way to evaluate it in the context of um, mm -hmm. of, of improvement of those results because mm -hmm. sometimes visually something might not look quite right yeah. because it doesn't have the right texture as you saw mm -hmm. but if that texture is really fundamentally random say mm -hmm. photo, photon noise then that's not key to the uh, to the task um, so anyway, that was my observation that to, yeah. defining success in, in terms of the final task might be good. Mm -hmm. That's uh, exactly what we thought about. And I'm glad you mentioned about that. And uh, so actually, um, we had some thoughts about, like you said, the final task. A lot mm -hmm. of bi biologists like want to segment a specific structure. Mm -hmm. So we can evaluate based on the segmented uh, results. Like if the segmented um a structure the similar volume or the mm -hmm. segmented uh, amount of signals like uh, how many how many segmented structures are there do they match with the uh, the, the high resolution images as a uh, evaluation but it can be so when we go to the individual cases it can be like a lot of different different ways we can do that because right. there are a lot of different tasks yeah so that's, we, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great point, and we definitely think that that's on our radar. The next yeah. things we need to it, do. It's, it's also a lot of effort too. Mm -hmm. You have to get actual cases to yeah. evaluate, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Thank you. 
Oh, thank you for the question. Sorry. Any other question? Um, I only had one other comment, and, mm -hmm. and that was uh, with the um, k-means or other methods of segmentation, sort of uh, multidimensional data. Mm -hmm. um, is there any application for statistical methods like principal component analysis? Um, is that something that is used in this field? Yes, we often use uh, PCA for uh, such, kind of, such kind of analysis. Actually, um, that's uh, the first thing we tried before we tried mm -hmm. the k-means. Um, to my memory, it didn't perform as well as what we like want it to be. So then we like change direction to to mm -hmm. to do it with k-means. Surprisingly, it performed very well. Yeah, PCA is very commonly used in the field. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. Good. Good to know. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you.